This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. It's okay. Welcome to Drinking with Authors. Woo! Woo! Thank you. We're at a writing retreat right now, so there are two of the other co-hosts in the background. They might interject. Um, but uh, we're here. I'm Erica Lance. With me today is Valerie Willis. And our special guest today is Jeffy Kennedy. Woo! <laughs> Yay! There, there's more sound clips that will be added by the producer. It'll make it sound like there's way more than four of us here present doing this. Um, so um, what are, we're, we're going to discuss what we're drinking. So I have a famous drinking with authors cup. I will send you one if you want. But in addition now, we have an addition. I absolutely want. I'm just going to throw that out there right now. Absolutely. I will email you. We have drinking with authors shot glasses now. So you can get a couple of those too. We're going to do a 12 shots at Christmas. It's going to be a terrible idea, but I came up with it and we're going to do it anyway. Oh boy. But I'm drinking um, Blue Moon and I even put the orange in it. Yeah, that's like one of the recommendations on the, even the commercials. Just no, that's why I did it. Just commercials. Oh, just yeah, it. just No, yeah, just yeah. In Okay, okay. I'm re <laughs> Valerie is literally why we can't have nice things. Continue <laughs> I'm on. I'm drinking... Um, Tried and true here uh, for me on the podcast, the Rose of Regalia, out of a fancy dragon mug. Thank you, mother-in-law, for the cool. So totally red awesome. red wine yep. Yep. Okay, Jeffy, what are you drinking along with us? I am drinking bubbly, my my favorite bubbly. Uh, it's a brut from Trader Joe's, Trader Jose's, uh, the Louise Destray brut, which Ooh. is very good for $9. And I keep it my little ice bag that I bought in St. Martin in case I ever have a yacht. And it has like even the little suction cups on the bottom so that it won't slide around if if you should reach any well, kind of that way. Is very top. practical and useful. Practical I'm and useful. planning ahead. Yes. <laughs> I'm very proud of you for that. I poured <laughs> in my cup and that was my major accomplishment of the day. So I was like, oh, we're getting blue moon. I need to get an orange. orange. Yes. I don't know. That might be the end no, of this. Stuck. Okay. Because yeah, I see you being. I know. Well, it's, I don't want to discuss it. It's stuck. <laughs> Let's move on to the podcast. So, Jeffy, will you tell our audience who may not know you what you write? I write fantasy and romance, uh, basically epic fantasy with romance in it. So sometimes it gets called romantic fantasy, sometimes fantasy romance, sometimes elements, you know. Awesome. Okay, cool. So when did you actually start writing? Well, the early 90s, which I believe will date me, but I started out as an essayist. And my first book was actually an essay collection. And then I moved into writing fiction. And my first fiction was published in 2010. So, we so went to, wait, nine, I got to keep up on the time here. So we're in the 90s and we're doing essays. And then 2010, that was my time machine. It needs some work. <laughs> it sounds like a broken transformer. It's, it may be broken transformer. <laughs> But then 2010, so what was your first book? It was called Wyoming Trucks, True Love, and the Weather Channel. That's a heck of a that's title. A, that's, so much, that's so much on that title. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how come, that is a very long title. How come it took you so long to, to put a novel out? Was it just not on your, like, things to do or? Well, yeah, I mean. It's a long story, but we have a long time, right? Yes, we do. Um, we have so much time. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in graduate school getting my PhD in neurophysiology, of all things. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to be a research scientist, and I was desperately unhappy. As Now I understand that everybody in grad school is desperately unhappy, but back then I thought that this was a real problem. And I asked myself one day, I had this total meltdown. I was at the neuroscience convention in New Orleans, which was like 60,000 people and all of the 
like every kind, they couldn't figure out how to chop up neuroscience. So it was like everybody from the brain surgeons to the people doing like neural networks on computers and so forth. And there was this massive poster session. You just go up and down and everybody could only talk about their work and they were all unhappy. And I was reading Anne Rice's Witching Hour that had just come out at that time. And so I was loving this book and hating being at this conference. And I had this graduate advisor who was a manic depressive Hungarian, which I'm <laughs> told is, is actually redundant. <laughs> and he was being mean to me. And I had a total meltdown. And I started crying in the middle of this convention. And I ran outside and I thought, okay, something's really wrong. And so I asked myself, well, if I could have any career at all, this is the wrong career. If I could have any career at all with no ifs, ands, or buts, or shoulds, what, what would it be? And I was very surprised that the answer was to be a writer because nobody ever told me, you know, nobody ever tells anybody that it's a good idea to be a writer. And so then I started taking classes at night sort of alongside my graduate stuff. And the first one I took was a class on essays, essays on self and place. And so my very first publication was an essay. And then, you know, so I, I have a full time, I, I cut bait on my PhD and got a master's. I got a job as an editor writer with a petroleum group so I could build my writing chops and writing essays and publishing in magazines. Uh, my biggest coup along this sort of road in the nineties was I had an essay in Red Book for which they oh. paid me a dollar a word. This is the old days. Oh my goodness. So I got $3,000 for one essay. Wow. That and was everybody's awesome. like, oh, you've made it now. You know, like how many times do you hear, oh, you've made it now. Uh, and not long after that, magazines really crashed because of the advent of blogging. But I had my first essay collection published in 2004. And that was my book, Wyoming Trucks, True Love and the Weather Channel, which was about living in Wyoming and meeting my true love who drove a pickup truck. Aww. <laughs> and then after this book came out, I didn't know what I was going to do next. And I was working on this narrative nonfiction book and I, I had good press on this essay collection and I had agents contacting me, you know, like emailing me saying, I read your book and you know, like the reviews were nice. They said things like, oh, she's a writer to watch, you know, and they're like, oh, I understand you're a writer to watch. And what are you working on now? So I would tell them about this narrative nonfiction book I was working on. And if we were in person, like I could watch their eyes roll back in their heads, you know, nobody liked this project. Everybody hated it. And I gave it to my editor who had published my first essay collection. And she read it and she said, you know, I think you're not ready to write this book, put it in a drawer for a year and then come back to it. And I was like, yeah, I was like, well, okay, what do I do now? Right. Apparently you need oh. to get a lot of drawers. That's, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> you get so many drawers. So happening. many drawers. <laughs> so many drawers. So could be another book. So many drawers. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Could be an essay collection. So right in there, you know, I was feeling like here I had lost my momentum, lost my opportunity. And I woke up one morning on a weekend. My husband was gone and it was raining. And I woke up from this dream about a neuroscientist who had fallen into fairy and became a sorceress. Okay. And she was like using scientific method to be a sorceress on this kind of thing. And I went and started writing this book and wrote it for like four, wrote on it for like four hours, which was very unusual for me then. I'd never done anything like it. And it was fun. It was so much fun. Oh, and so I developed this brilliant plan where I would write fantasy romance, although it wasn't a genre then. And you know, this sort of wonderful thing that I thought, oh, I created this and it was such a great plan. And I would write that and make tons of money and use that to fund my very serious nonfiction writing career. Ah. But reader, things did not go that smoothly. No, no, no. no. And hold on one second. 
because we're with two other writers Shush, over there, <laughs> Missies. Shush, shush. <laughs> Sorry, we're back. We're at a All right. We decided to do a writer's retreat and I'm hearing them in the bathroom talking, editing, and I'm like, shut it. I don't have a pillow to throw at people. You need like a dart gun. Ooh. Yeah, well, it's (laughs) get violent up in here. Here, see, these are our two other. No, (laughs) hi. (laughs) Sorry about that. We're really professional here at Drinking with Authors. Okay. Well, I mean, it's it's all in the brand. I mean, you know that from the title. <laughs> we can pretty much get away with almost anything. anything. Yeah. <laughs> think about it. So you you start writing. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, neuroscience. Yeah. I think it's it's amazing that that was the path you were going down, and then going. I don't like this at all. It actually, because Melinda's the one that turned us on to you and she was a lawyer and then was like, I hate everything about this. <laughs> well, there, there are an amazing number of, uh, especially women authors, I think, who, of our generation who kind of got the reverse end of that whole girls can't do math science. If we were good at like math science logic stuff, they're like, oh, hooray, let's push you into these stem professions or and i think law counted is that and we got in them and then we were we were like oh we don't like this wow no i no i i completely agree so um you start writing fiction how many books do you have published right now i never know the exact count but if you count like novellas and shorts and stuff it's up around 40. wow, wow. that's congratulations impressive. congratulations so you you start getting into writing um and you start doing this how much do you how much do you write a year do you feel like if you're writing and you're really doing it not in the time of covid because that's changed things for everybody on the planet but how how much writing do you get done in a time period i i actually know exactly because i haven't left my scientific self that far behind and i track everything i do on on spreadsheets i'm the excel queen And so I uh, have been tracking my word count since 2012. And I know exactly, I try to write, uh, my sustainable productivity is 3,000 words a day, five days a week. So I write in the neighborhood of 500,000 words a year. Wow. That is awesome. That is, that is, I'm I'm not quite there yet. I'm, I'm, I'm catching up though. I'm catching but up. But I also write full time. I don't have the day job any longer. So that's what I can do now. I've tried to write more, but I find I, you know, like I can, I can do more, but then I crash. But self-care. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a, a misconception that people, people forget that most of us all start with having a day job and family to straddle a little bit and that's okay. Um, but self-care, you have to include self-care as part of your process. You have to have a day where you're not doing writing or day job and, and remember that you are a person and human being at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to be able to refill the well, because, because you can drain that well dry and it sucks. No, totally. I, I agree a hundred percent. What I, I'm going to have an entire sentence come out of my mouth there in a moment. Oh, we're excited. That'll be great. Yeah, no. <laughs> they did breath, everyone. They did the breath. The moon is coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's already arrived. I don't know what you're talking about. I fixed the orange show. Um, <laughs> how come you didn't go into sci-fi? I mean, so you, you were set up kind of to go into a science fiction with what you were working on for your PhD in a way, in a way. Uh-huh. No, but oh. she was a fan of Anne Rice. She's okay, a I understand. Lover at Do heart. not let her <laughs> answer the question. <laughs> so my my gateway drug to science fiction fantasy was Anne McCaffrey. I read Dragon Song when I was like in fifth grade, um, and and I was in a soft science, and and you have to you know, like the 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 engineers, the tech people will be the first to tell you that us biologists were the soft science so it's like we're the fantasy side of the science fiction fantasy okay. i literally just learned something right there uh-huh. i know about hard science and soft, soft science. science well it sounds dirty it does it sounds like an erotica novel it, it does my hard science 
that be that would be a good one you know like the uh the engineer and the life scientist and yeah that's true it would be okay so then you um where do you get inspired from let's ask that because a lot of us have different points that we get inspired from you're writing my fantasy stuff where does a lot of your inspiration come from 40 books it's a lot um you know it's almost like where doesn't it come from that's i i get uh ideas from everything but i'm i'm a write for discovery writer i don't pre-plot i can't outline to save my life i was that kid in school who like if they made us turn in an outline i would write the paper first and then make the outline from it uh, so for me the process of writing is like opening a door and letting the floor the story flow in and so for me i'm a character-based writer character-driven writer so i start with character and i look at like what is the world around them like i i i ride around in their heads and see and experience what they do and you know kind of get the story that way so you're like a full-on pantser i'm a full-on pantser i am far in spectrum pantser yeah i'm full-on pantser i can't i can't do the outlining i'm similar to you somebody's like outline i'm like no but i'm just writing the story what is this outline crap it's uh, yeah i'm more of a planter so i'll have like a rough outline that I kind of go with, but I leave enough space because I know, because I'm also character driven because my characters will ne like, they will reveal a thing and I'm like, woo woo, but what about this thing in the plot? And they said, no, 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 wait for it. You know, and I feel like I'm just following along. I never yeah. know where it's really how, how the twists and turns get to those plot points. Usually the characters reveal it through the writing. So when you've done traditional publishing though, and a lot of times they want you to tell them what you're going to write about. So yeah how do you get around that little situation i want to know how you that your get out of jail free card because we 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 have a small publishing company but we're like you know hybrid independence we don't have to tell anybody what we're writing about so how do you get around that um i bullshit a lot <laughs> pop open another bottle of wine for this yeah <laughs> no i'm just okay. pour, i have i have my one here from my ice bed so i'm just sort of refilling um <laughs> i give i've actually gotten kind of good at this and my agent is very helpful in that she will kind of help me flesh it out but and i have friends who will help me flesh it out too people who are much better at pre-plotting than i am but I can usually know what my characters are and what their situation is. So uh, the way one of my friends described my own process to me that made sense is she said, it's like, I know I'm driving from Seattle to New Orleans. I just don't know exactly how I'm going to get there. I know I'm going to have to cross the Rocky Mountains at some point. I might end up spending a long weekend in St. Louis and never quite get across the Mississippi, but I kind of know what the general road trip is going to be. Um, so I can talk about my characters starting out in Seattle and what their lives are like. And I can spin a pretty good paragraph on, you know, sort of the standard, what do your characters want and what's keeping them from getting it. And then I, I use um, hijinks in Sue a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a fun story that I like to share with people all the time, uh, and this is in a documentary that's available on Amazon Prime about the start of Image Comics, and towards the end, they're interviewing the author for The Walking Dead, and they're like, well, they turned down my first pitch, and then on the second pitch, he says, you're going to have to give me a twist I, I can't say no to, and he says, well, you know, and he goes through the initial premise of Walking Dead, and he goes, and then come to find out it's aliens. So the guy goes, okay, fine. I want to see how you're going to add aliens into this. Let's do this. Took a chance on him. And like three or four books in, he's like, hey, when are, when are the aliens showing up? He goes, you said to give you a twist. You didn't say I had to write it. <laughs> 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 and, and it is, it's, um, you know, stories can take on, I think a writer knows when they're telling a good story sometimes too yes so, do you so when you turn in this idea so you're like we're going to new orleans and then you get there and you're like we ended up in alaska is your publisher like how the crap did you end up in alaska you told us you're going to new orleans 
or they are no. so used to you they're like never mind we don't actually care she's gonna tell us where she's going but she's lying she's and perfect. it turns out that alaska is awesome and perfect and way better than new orleans i mean that's that's basically how it works um my editors know that um they know that I'm going to deliver. I mean, maybe that's part of it. After a while, you sort of develop a reputation and they trust you. And it, I, I would not be able to work with an editor who expected me to deliver a, de a detailed outline and stick to it. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't sign that contract because I know I can't do it. No, that, so, I think that's, that's brilliant in knowing important. that because I think that's one of the things that can, if writers don't understand where they're at as writers and then agree to do something, then you're kind of stuck because they'll eventually send people to your door to go, we need this manuscript. And you're like, fun story. Do you guys know any good ghost writers? Cause <laughs> I don't want to go to new Orleans. So, um, do you, when you're, when you start writing, do you always um, intend for a, one of your series to be a series? Have you had it be that you're writing a book and then the series you're like, well, I wasn't expecting to continue? Yes, um, pretty much always. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, apparently, I think in series, and I didn't realize this for a long time, but I my stories end up being much longer than I think that they'll be. And probably this has to do with like traveling to New Orleans via Alaska and getting stuck in St. Louis. Um, I, I end up having a lot more story than I anticipate. I'm getting much better at this point at being able to set my arc to a more expected like three books if I know I'm going to write a trilogy. So like I, my most recent one is I did um, this trilogy with St. Martin's. And so Orchid Thrones book one, Fiery Crowns book two, and Promised Queen is book three out in May. And so when, when we sold that series to them, I had written like 100 pages of the Orchid Throne and we sold it on spec. And so I hadn't finished writing the book yet. But because they bought the trilogy and they said, okay, we want this to be a three book story and you can have the same hero heroine for all three books, which is what I wanted. It's a marriage of convenience story, enemies to lovers. And so I really wanted the time to develop their relationship. And so I did better that time at being able to confine it to the three books and shape it that way. But what happens when they come back and go, we want the next three in that series? Well, then that's why you spin off to secondary characters. I like that. I like that. I think it's interesting because talking to authors, especially ones who initially write a book, not thinking it's going to be that or write something thinking it's going to be a three part series. I, I It's always fascinating to me because when it's very successful and somebody comes back and goes, but we want X more of them. And you're kind of like, cool. So it ended um <laughs> we are going to revive them from the dead and there I, is a transporter and, I, and, and don't you think you can always sense that when writers are like extending a story beyond what oh they want to do and it's one of my biggest pet peeves where i'm like you're now just writing for money you're just writing yeah. for you know yeah. and i understand that don't get me wrong it's if something is successful and i think sometimes it's not there heart project that ends up being the successful one like they have these things and they're like i'm gonna write this thing they start going down a path and then they're down the path and everybody's like oh my god we love you and they're like yeah i had like four books and i don't know where to okay i'm yep i can write stuff you know <laughs> well, so you know like a, a famous author of vampire books uh i i don't know should i should i name her but you, I, I okay. trust me. I, I, I've named up Laurel K. Hamilton. Don't get me started with the 29 <laughs> books in that series. I love her and I've read every one and I've bought them, but I'm like, what the crap sticks is happening right now. And I think I fell off around book nine and I loved them, loved them for a long time. But then I was like, I can't, I can't take any more boyfriends. I'm just, okay. You <laughs> yeah. Do not read any of the recent ones then. Cause the entire book is about polyamory. Yeah, I know. Little plots sprinkled in, but like you would sprinkle pepper. 
On and I was that. team Jean-Claude. I mean, I was just like, can we just stick with Jean-Claude? And yeah. Okay, well, were you Edward or were you <laughs> Jacob? No, you don't have to answer that question. No, Edward. I mean, it, it was funny because <laughs> I was Jacob. Jacob. Who? It was funny because this has never happened to me with anything else. But I was reading. I think the second book was that Eclipse. I'd been reading it on an airplane, That's and That's it was book two. And I was waiting at baggage claim for the bags to come, and standing there reading my paper book. And this woman walks up to me and she said, Team Jacob or Team Edward? And I'm like, there's a Team Jacob? <laughs> <laughs> and she says, exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness. It, it's, it's funny. Oh, go ahead. Name your vampire person. Mm. That's too far. Charlene Harris. Yeah. Charlene Harris. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Very you. famously... Yeah was done with that series she did not want to write more and they kept upping the money and they offered her like millions of dollars to write three more books and so she was like oh my god fine and you know and, and she shouldn't have written those books no i think that's true although one of the other writers in the room here is very happy that she ended up with sam and yeah whatever she's <laughs> <laughs> we are not starting an argument on this podcast since you're not co-hosting it right now that's true <laughs> yes eric but northman I'm a, sam, I'm North sam i should have been eric yes thank you eric, never okay we're not talking to you anymore <laughs> so i think that's fascinating so let's talk about writing in the romance so um you write love stories, which is fantastic. What's your favorite part about writing the love stories? Because you seem to like the bad boys. From the names you've listed off, you mm. like the bad boy characters. Yeah, but I don't like the alpha holes, you know? So it's, I I like the um, sort of the, the tough guy and I love the sexual tension, but he also has to be, you know, the, the cinnamon roll inside, the really the good guy after all. So what um, romantic characters don't you like? Oh, I don't know. What what would be some, what would be, throw me some. Well, let's think. Because, vampire Diaries. There's, okay. I, I didn't okay. write those. Well, with, That's where you went. Well, Damien's like, Damien da is, that's why I keep saying Damien. I don't da know. Are you, are you in the Omen or are you in Vampire Diaries? It's <laughs> I. Why don't you have some more wine, Val? You're doing so well with know, that. So um, even in like the True Blood series, like Bill, like we didn't even mention Bill in the True Blood series, right? So, okay. Right. So um, we had Bill in the True Blood series. We also had Alcide in the True Blood series. So you have, you know, those ones. But even in like, I look at... Um, some of the characters in, for instance, you know, the Jacob Edward thing, the whole like imprint thing, and then the whole relationships between all of the siblings in the, yeah, yeah. you know, um, house, yeah. Alice, Jasper, like, it's interesting because it, to me, it kind of touches on when we're reading fantasy, it's that whole, I'm about to get very pro philosophical here on this oh right but yes let's get we're, philosophical we're gonna get philosophical do you need more wine for your philosophical <laughs> no no okay. i'm already falling behind so you you have the you know the the soccer moms that want to be in a fantasy world of these epic romance stories right and then you go right. where is the borderline of an unhealthy romance story bad boy but what do we actually want to read because you know we all might have people in our lives and we've had romantic moments, but if you really think about writing them down in a book and you're like, you know what, nobody's going to think that's nearly as entertaining because they weren't there in that moment. And it's not like this big sweeping gesture of the rose pe roses all around the room and the petals going in and somehow you mystically broke into your fucking house and put flowers <laughs> everywhere. Like, don't get me started on that being wrong. But like, <laughs> at what point in time are we like, does it get into this is fantasy and it's purely to think like that versus this is something you want to obtain in a relationship you know you see where I, I wrote with that that's a lot i know that was a lot but i think it's 
you know, I've never really liked it when, you know, and this was sort of like a whole broad stroke on romance where they act like women are somehow too stupid to distinguish fantasy from reality. And, you know, it's like the fantasy of the powerful guy who watches you sleep and breaks into your house and skittles rose petals everywhere and says, I won't hear no, you will be mine is a powerful, wonderful fantasy that's probably a very deep part of our female nature. If we want to go back to neurophysiology, that that is. Did you see how we circle back to that? Yeah, we circle back, right? (laughs) It, it, It rocks our world on a very basic visceral sexual side. And, you know, knowing that, that that is something that is thrilling and wonderful to read, Versus picking someone who will be a decent life partner who will share things like cleaning toilets and grocery shopping. Those are very different sides of our lives. And we are smart enough to know that. It's, it's true. It's very funny. I saw a post on social media the other day and it said sexiest man alive. And it was this, you could tell it. it new father he has a little kid but he's like vacuuming in the pictures and he's folding laundry and he sent him to his wife and it's really funny because he's an average guy not unattractive not attractive he's not like some dashing model with bulging muscles and tattoos you know but he's Get sitting there and he took a picture of himself like vacuuming and he's like <laughs> with the vacuuming and he's like <laughs> pointing to the dishes being done and <laughs> I was just like Sexy, it's true. That is one of the sexiest men alive. Because, yes, we want the dashing and the roses, but man, if they will give you a foot rub or bring you a soda from the other room, sometimes you're like, you are the most romantic person ever. (laughs) Yes. I mean, like sometimes my husband will just like pour me a glass of wine and hand it to me, you know, and we could say, you know, that like he's managing me, managing me or whatever. But, you know, that's also that's true love you know it's like here honey have a glass of wine and chill <laughs> you know, or, it's, or uh, some cheeseburgers because you're hangry cheese, and i don't right. want to do it <laughs> uh, or or i stopped by the gas station got you doritos <laughs> chocolate no <laughs> valerie was arguing earlier because i don't think she realizes the amount of doritos that she eats since we're on regular things with her and she's like I don't eat that many. I'm like, I can count on my hand the number of times you were not eating Doritos while we were on the call. <laughs> but it's true. I think that's a romantic part of, uh, you know, that's the more sweet, tender moments versus the very passionate, like, I'm being swept off my feet. He doesn't sweep you off your feet by bringing you that glass of wine. But man, does that say, I'm thinking of you, I love you, I care about you, and I want you to be happy. Like, yes you know, and that's not what you get necessarily by him showing up saying, we can't be friends. Right. I can't talk to you. And those things don't necessarily make for good fiction. That's the thing, you know, is that it's, you know, what makes a good story? What makes a book that transports you and gives you escape is something totally different than what you need for, you know, dealing with the kids every day. Yeah. It's like giving you different like it's obviously fantasy based situations, but they're also romanticized in a, in a unique way. So like, my God, this hot, gorgeous guy that's sitting on her now is a vampire. What is she going to do to solve this? And he's addicted to her blood and you know, he can't live without her. There are three things for which I'm certain. I say this all the time. It's not a joke with my friends. I'll call them and I'm like, there are three things for which I'm certain. And I'll say the first two, you know, that Edward is a vampire or whatever. And then I'm like, hey, do you want to go to the mall later? That was when we could go to the mall, but that was number three. Back in the day. Back in the day. Yeah. That was such a long day ago though. Okay, we have to take a quick break. We're going to take a quick break and we will be right back with Jeff Kennedy. Okay. Sample locally sourced, quality distilled spirits in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge at Skunk Brothers Distillery. We're family owned, brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits, just like our grandfather did back in the Prohibition era. From handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers spirits straight from the source. 
It's all in the family at Skunk Brother Spirits, located in Stevenson, Washington. And we're back. <laughs> Do you have an appointment yet? <laughs> no, so, I'm Luke scared now. <laughs> <laughs> I can never drink. <laughs> she gets really fun. You should hear her what she told poor Jonathan Mayberry about destroying manatees. It I was no, uh, it's a true story. <laughs> no, nah. Okay, so um when when you're writing and you're writing um these characters, do you ever find yourself having a hard time like nailing a character down? Do you do research around actual characters that you put in your book? Are they always ones you sort of form? Um, I don't do research on characters. Um, so some writer, and I think it was Philip Jose Farmer, but I haven't been able to ever find the quote again, said that the act of writing is like building a campfire and the light and heat reaches into another world. And if you're lucky, people from the other world will come and sit at the campfire and tell you their stories. And, and I love that because that's how it feels to me. It's I, uh, because I'm character driven, I know who the character is first, usually almost always the heroine and, and she will tell me her story. So I don't really have to research anything. Um, Did you ever base any characters off of people, you know? I, I should know an easy answer to this because I've gotten asked it before. Not really. Um, sometimes I borrow people's situations. Uh, you know, like I, I knew a, a gal that I used to work with who had been, um, she had graduated from Yale and moved back to her incredibly tiny small town because her mother was kind of crazy and her dad couldn't deal with the mom and kind of emotionally blackmailed her into moving back home and so i used like that situation but the person i used it for ended up being very different than she was no that makes sense i i find a lot of people watching i do a ridiculous amount of people watching <laughs> for just being a, a writer in general is watching people watching how they interact. I do human resources as a day job. Wow. So I get to see, she get to see so oh, many, so many people. funny and the really not funny parts of people. And it's interesting because it gives me a lot of inspiration as to um, being able to think with a situation. Cause a lot of us get put in a situation and we go, God, I would never do that. Or why did they do that? Or why did they let that happen? And I think it's, the, as a writers, our, it's our job to go, let me take you on the little journey of how we got here. Yeah. Right? Like, let's, let's go to why in this person's mind, the character was okay or whatever. Sarissa Hernandez is a literary agent in the, and she once said, um, a good story answers what if. What if this happened and then dissects it and breaks it apart and gets us there. Yeah. I think that's a great way of, of describing it, like a solid plot or, or a good story. Yeah, it, really makes sense. It, it should make you feel like, well, how'd they get there? <laughs> like, what, what, like Fight Club is a, a good I example. love that book so much. The book, you know, the movie is brilliant, actually, but the book is pretty like, epically like, written. Like, how did he get himself in this situation? And, and then, you know, even when you do conclude a good story, you still have that drive of, did I miss something? And you tend to go back and read it again. And I think, I think that's important to me as, personally as a reader and why I like fantasy, like Anne McCaffrey. I actually uh, bought the audiobook of Dragon Song just to listen to it. And it was, and there was this- You bought it just to listen to it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bought an audio well, It's a good reason to buy an audio book. That, that's I read great. it like two or three times. But listening to it, it was like <laughs> experiencing the story. You're making this hard. I'm drunk. I know. <laughs> You're like, I it's bought so, an audio book so, so, so. to listen to it. And I'm like, that's good. At least you didn't buy it for some other purpose. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you discover different ways, uh, different things about the story every time. There we go. I got it out. <laughs> that is true. 
so about your writing, do you, I'm, I'm assuming because you're a big deal, uh, do people, <laughs> have to, well, you are a very big deal. So we're very lucky to have you on the podcast. Um, Thank you. Do you go back and reread your stuff? How do you feel about doing that? Because a lot of authors have very different emotions when they go back and somebody goes, oh my God, could you read a passage out of book one for our writing law? And you're like, no, I don't like that book. <laughs> well, how, how do you feel about them? I think I'm actually kind of a monster that way because I love reading my own books. Oh, no, I think that's, that's great, great. But do you ever, like, I th I don't know if this is true for everybody, so I'm not going to say it this way. Sometimes I'll go back and read stuff that I wrote 10 years ago and I'm reading it and I'm like, oh my God, I need to rewrite this. Like, this is terrible, but I have to walk away. And I say this to myself all the time. If I'm reading something, just read it. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear the story, but don't go. Cause we're always better writers. Like the next book, you're a better writer than you were the last book, depending on how much alcohol you drank while you were writing it. But you're <laughs> always, you know, generally a better writer, the next book, the next book. So you go back over a period of time and you read it and you're like, Oh, I should have done this different thing. Do you encounter that? Or do you just love what you've encapsulated and you're good? Well, my my first novel my first series would you know and and the first it was the the story of the neuroscientist who went to to ferry um there's some stuff i cringe over in that and if i could i would go back and rewrite it and i've talked about doing that but i also feel like that's water under the bridge and i'm not going to do that um i think you know and that, that book would not be happy if you did that right you know, right. that's, that's the other flip side is how yeah. we feel about it versus how the fans feel about that. Absolutely. You know, and, and this might feel like a little bit of a tangent, but it's really stuck with me. I once saw an interview with Janine Garofalo oh, and yeah. she was talking about the movie, um, the cats and dogs ones. Um, oh, the truth about cats and dogs. That's yeah. it. Thank you. The truth about cats and dogs. And she was saying, cause I love that movie. I thought that a charming movie i rewatch it occasionally and she was totally trashing that movie and she said that she thought it was a terrible movie and a terrible story and that she wished she'd never done it and i thought wow that really impacts how i feel about this movie that i that i love that i think is charming and wonderful and gives me good feels and and after I read that, I thought, you know what? I have to be really super careful when talking about my own books that even if there is something in there that I feel like I wish that I could fix, somebody out there still loves the book. And I don't want to, you know, like rain on that particular parade because so, it really changed how I felt about Jenny Garofalo. I was like, oh, wow. Well, okay. You know, it's interesting because I, you watch a lot of, oh, now that we have, um, social media or internet press i don't know and like platforming is such a big part of what we do in present day publishing a lot of new time writers and authors don't realize how much weight even just before the first book release their social media their words their interaction with the audience can have um you know we've we've yeah. heard ways of tweeting a thing and it just derailing an entire career before it even got off the ground we we tell authors that all the time we're like listen you can have whatever opinions you want like we have authors under our publishing company and we're like we don't we don't mind your opinion but the moment you're you're doing this you're the moment you sign this contract with this you're a celebrity you're a public figure. so here are some things that you need to understand about your celebrity like on your own personal stuff whatever but what you say matters and the internet doesn't care what's behind the story. The internet cares about the title of whatever. Yeah, the they're just going to see that little line. Just yeah, that. that's all they care about. And trolls will rip you to shreds and you won't realize that that maybe wasn't the intention of what your communication was, but it was true. What I was going to say is I think people who talk negatively about works they've done it's very interesting because again, we can always improve in their stuff. And like, like for Laurel K. Hamilton, who's on book 29, um, or <laughs> 29 now. I love um, how you know that and that you really mentioned it more I than once. Them. So I can say this, like I met her at Dragon Con. I took a book she had where she said the word wound 13 times in the first page of one of the chapters. And Ooh. I just think, where the fuck was your editor? But I met her and I go, 
I would like that level of success. She interacts with her fans a lot. I would love that level of success. I would hope I got it differently, but it's kind of like as much as I think E.L. James is a, a fucking terrible author, I would love that level of success. I think a lot of us would. And well, yeah. you, you have to own that when you're going into that situation that um, you can't go and say this is terrible or this is horrible because you have so many people that may love exactly what you're doing or may love a character. Like I could sit here and go, who's your least favorite character? I'm not legitimately asking that because I would hate for you to say a name of a character and you're like, Cole's my least favorite character. And all the Cole fans in the world like obliterate you on tri- Twitter for saying that you don't like Cole or something. Yeah. And I actually don't have a least fa- favorite character. So. so I should pause for just a moment and shut my blind because the sun's starting to set. That's fine. You can That's do fine. that. Can Absolutely. Do that. All right. <laughs> it's got a real sun effect, though. I'm not, I'm not right. It is. Yes. <laughs> see the sun rays <laughs> the sun thank goodness is co-hosting because she's allergic to sunlight. she is allergic to we sunlight. have a, do we have an answer okay yeah, i can tell you've been drinking why don't you keep sharing personal information you want to say what oh, she's doing right now that's out loud too <laughs> <laughs> she's a real life vampire technically it's awesome she's like In edward very scary yeah. Way. yeah yeah but she just you don't know that. Have you seen her in the sun? No. Yeah. So shut up. Oh, look at Jim shake her head. She's like, she goes to think that. Incense numbered. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about your fans. So um, what are your fans like? They're all brilliant, clever people with exquisite taste. <laughs> So, have you had anybody um, role play and dress up as your characters and show up? To yes. Oh, yes. tell us about that. I love that. It's one of my favorite things. I, it's my favorite thing too. I haven't had it happen in real life at a con, although that's like one of my author goals. I would absolutely love that. But some of the bookstagrammers do it. They'll do a little bit of cosplay and dress up as my characters and put it on Instagram, and that's just amazing. It's awesome. So the invitation gauntlet has been thrown. So when we can do cons in person again. Soon. Jeffy Jeffy requires that somebody dress up as at least one of her characters and show up. Do you think you'd recognize all the characters if they dressed up and showed up in front of you? I wonder. Um, I hope that I would. But to my chagrin, I have had people come up to me and quote me things from my books. And I don't recognize it. I was going to ask you that next. So I had that. I actually was lucky enough to have, even though not, not as big a deal as you, a fangirl moment where this fangirl was like, are you blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, my other writing name, which is Dahlia Lance. And she's like, oh my God, I love your book. I love the part. And she starts rattling this thing off. And I was like, yay, I'm so glad you love it. <laughs> like, I was just like, great. I'm like, what the fuck is she talking about? I had to go find I know, her. I, I know. The shelf, and she's like, what is it? <laughs> oh, I did write that. I did. That's what I said. Yeah, because you I, don't always remember things that you've written. And, I mean, it's fun to kind of go on Goodreads and see which quotes people highlight because it's like not the things that you would think. What are the quotes that you, that, what is the most famous quote do you think from your writing that people say all the time? I actually know this one because it's from my book that I, I won the Rita Award for uh, that the main character, oh no, wait, I take that back. The original quote came in the first book of the series in the Mark of the Tala, but it's the heroine of that book. But she says, she discovers um the, the heroine's trying to find her way out of a siege and this other character is a librarian basically and she finds the old blueprints to the castle and finds a secret passage out and she says this is why it's perilous to ignore a librarian and okay, so many librarians out there that i'm like sure think just... that's the most brilliant quote that could ever be said that that one i i'm sure that one's been shared more than any other Have you ever put yourself in one of your books? I mean, don't we put ourselves in all of our characters? Yes, that's a very generic answer. You can't get away with just that. (laughs) Okay. Um, You can't get away with just that one. 
But I mean, it's true. All of my characters do have parts of me. There are definitely characters that are more of me than others. And people who know me well have picked out those characters. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely some characters that are much more me than others. A lot of my weird terminology makes it in, like there was the whole discussion of underoos and so using underwear. Apparently her whole household says underoos, which is a legitimate thing, but they say that instead of underwear. And I'm like, nobody that wasn't born in 1970 is going to know what the crap sticks are. But unfortunately, I know what underoos are. So, you know, I think that's unfortunate, girlfriend. not unfortunate. I'm very happy that I grew up in a time when there wasn't the internet because, oh my gosh, I would be in such a different situation from things. Um, when you write, do you like to, so let's, let's set the mood. We're setting the mood. We're creating okay. the writing environment. What, how do you write? Like, is it quiet? Is there music? Is there, you know, what do you use to write on? Do you use like this epic laptop? Are you a desktop person? Or you're like, screw that shit. I'm using my iPad. Like what, tell us about your writing now. Well, so I'm a pretty ritualized writer. Um, I like total silence. I have a walking desk, so I walk seven to 10 miles a day as I'm writing. I have a hydraulic desk. I'm sort of sitting to the side of it and the treadmill's over here, but I can um, raise and lower the desk. Oh, you're too. Oh, oh, oh. Super. Have different ergonomics. I know it's seriously fancy. So I write in the mornings cause that's when my brain is freshest and I write for, um, usually three one hour sessions with about a 20 minute break between and shoot for 3000 words. And sometimes I go into a fourth session if I want, if I'm, if I'm close to getting the 3000 words and depending on what I have to do in the afternoon. Um, so, so yeah, I, in public spaces for you. What's that? No writing in public spaces. No, for you. no. So, you know, a lot of people who have been impacted by that change to their writing schedule, you know, the people who are like, you know, I used to write at the coffee shop and now I can't and it's blown my whole thing. Um, I live kind of out in the country. I live outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh, and yeah, it's beautiful. It's so, so that's beautiful there. I have my big window where I look down the valley to the Galisteo Basin and the uh, wow. uh, Sandia Peak and so forth. So I have this gorgeous view that I can look out over my desk. And I, you know, I already didn't leave my house for days at a time anyway. So now it's a virtue. Instead of people <laughs> giving me shit about it, I'm like being good. And yeah, I mean, it's just me and my husband at this point in time that, you know, kids are all grown up and we have grandchildren. So, you know, we have a pretty quiet house. And so I'm very fortunate that way that I'm able to have a um, very quiet time to write where I can really focus and get the words in. So jealous. This, my last week, this last week, I've woken up at like 4 a.m. to the six-year-old arguing with the Basset Hound about who sleeps where, because apparently the Basset Hound will try to sneak out of his room and snuggle with the small one and the small one will lead him back to his bed and say he's like no Dudley that's my bed not your bed your bed is here and he loses it every time the dog starts to follow him back <laughs> that's a whole it's a whole thing I mean, what I think is funny <laughs> is that you're going to listen to this episode and be like wow did I hear that story <laughs> it's like why did I bring up the Basset Hound anecdote <laughs> at this point <laughs> Like I've been trying to write early in the morning around six, seven a.m. before my day starts, because, like you said, one, your your brain's the freshest in the morning, but two, the I my day job that I still have hasn't had time to take its toll on me. Right. So I've learned that I can get a larger word counts out during that same amount of time that elsewhere during my day it's just not as productive. But no, I I totally get that. You wake up at at four to to a dog and a child arguing about whose bed is what i don't know why you don't write that as a story that's a story in and of itself well i quote my husband in a lot of my erotica so that's oh that's something you should yell out 
<laughs> is the is the dragon mug part of those scenes? So, uh, um, so she writes fantasy <laughs> too. <laughs> This, this is cute. I like you just like how drunk she is. Blew her you, brain right there. Did you see this? Yeah. <laughs> see, she's bright red right now. And <laughs> talk to you about. Let's do that. We're gonna open the door to talking about the gallery. Oh, no. sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, the the no, yes! oh, no, yes! not the journalist. So this goes into the subject of reviews, but Valerie writes about urban a legend, urban legend erotica. That's one of the series that she writes. So she did like sleeping with Sasquatch, cuddling with Chupacabra. Get back on camera. And okay. naked with the New Jersey Devil. We actually had a New Jersey Devil researcher reach out to us and say, hey, can I ask some questions about this book? So being the little research person that she is, she was like, yeah, sure. All he wanted to know was how she could understand how a male would feel during the sex scenes. And it was... <laughs> he, he, he wanted one. He you wanted to know, say the whole sentence. He wanted to know how I knew how, how men felt during sex because as a fellow fantasy romance writer, my thing is I write male main characters. So I get a lot of crap for that, but I don't get complaints about it um, because this journalist, as it's proven, he says, how did you know uh, about the male sensations and how many men did you interview? And of course, my gay friend goes, what a great way of putting this. He says, I'm not whoring around. I'm just interviewing men. <laughs> <laughs> so I Which is to awesome because it's like, how many men did I interview or how I many interviews a lot of men for no, her I books. Don't. no <laughs> I've been happily married for god it's two, 2007 I can't do math she's having to count it's not a good thing no it's okay. never a good thing it's no. okay I, I can tell because the other thing is when she laughs really hard like that she gets more drunk so this is going to be fun soon <laughs> um, all right let's talk about your reviews though do you read your reviews I read some. Um, I do not read them all. If somebody tags me, I will often look. Um, but, you know, overall, even good reviews are distracting. It's really hard when you have those other voices in your head while you're writing, because a good review, you're thinking, oh, well, you know, they're, they're all fans of coal uh you know and, and and i can't possibly uh do this thing with coal because then they're going to kill me um so so yes i read reviews some uh especially because it's always good to like grab those poll quotes you know so if you're doing promo it's like you've got to look and grab that so you can push it uh you know, like I've been doing that today because we just came out with this anthology on Thursday, the Under a Winter Sky yeah. fantasy romance midwinter holiday anthology. And, you know, but it's always, it always feels like a little bit of a dance because you never know when you're going to look at one where they're like, well, Jeffy Ken especially doing collections like that. And they're like, well, you know, I loved all the stories except for Jeffy Kennedy's, which sucked. <laughs> you know, and you're like, Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, you know, and, and it's interesting you say that because, uh, you know, when it comes to reviews, I know some authors don't read them because they're just, they don't want to have that in their brain. And I know some authors that are just, they'll read all the positive ones. They won't read the negative ones. I read all of them. I know you read all, this wasn't about <laughs> you. Bring it in. We're, we're talking about other authors now for just a moment. It's not your podcast. <laughs> Um, it's hard if you read all of them. I have friends where I'm always telling them, stop reading your reviews. Stop going on fucking Goodreads. Oh, there was the first <laughs> one. And <laughs> I'm emotional about it. I'm just curious, but it doesn't hold weight about how I'm going to write the next book because I already know how I'm going to write the next book. Um, but it always cracks me up when I get the, the low reviews because it, to me, it justifies the high reviews. So if I get a good smattering, then I know I'm... I know who my audience was 
And most of the time, my negative reviews are people pissed about things I wanted in the story anyway. And I'm like, I'm glad you didn't miss the point. <laughs> I always just think to myself, I'm super glad you bought my book. Thank <laughs> you for supporting my writing career. I, I mean, you. that's the thing is that all reviews in a way are good reviews because that that's what helps get you visibility and it means that somebody read it. And yeah, so, you know, I appreciate all the reviewers and i i really do believe and i know that's a line that a lot of authors say but i believe it's true that reviews are for readers yeah. and so that's why like i go in and i try to grab pull quotes that i'll tell people what, what what's expect. in the book and what they may or may not want from it but otherwise i try not to let it influence me too much because i mean i'm not as big a person as you are i, I it's hard for me to kick those oh, voices out of my head sometimes <laughs> I'm a snowflake. <laughs> Just everybody, you're a snowflake. You're special, is what you are. Um, no, but I think it's true. I think it, as a writer, it's any piece of art. You're an artist. I think sometimes people forget writers are artists, and this is our life. This is what you know. This is sometimes our heart and soul that's coming out into the pages. And when people go, "Well, that's terrible." Well, that's kind of like if you had a brilliant piece of artwork on the wall and people are like, that's really dumb. I hate that. Yeah, and not everyone like Van Gogh. Yeah. Everyone like Picasso. Uh, Picasso? Is that where you're going? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it was very good. I'm impressed you got that. <laughs> you, do you ever think about writing under other genres? Well, I've actually written um it i started out of course in nonfiction, and then i my first publications were you know bdsm erotica oh that's so and i did some very hot contemporary romance too and along with the fantasy romance so i actually violated that rule where you know they say to be successful as an author you should really try to write your first books all in one genre and that'll help you build your career and all of that and i didn't do that and it did make it harder so don't do what i did but no, i think it's true and i think um when when we tell writers that it's not that you can't have different voices in your head and different things you communicate it's that you have to remember there's an audience out there and the audience for your BDSM erotica may not be your same audience for high fantasy romance, but the way the nature of the beast is they're going to keep buying everything that has your name on it. Like people don't realize they're not looking to go, oh, well, I like this book. They're like, oh my God, a new Jeffy Kennedy, bye. And then all of a sudden it goes from being this high fantasy thing to this weird serial killer mystery crime thriller and your They're audience really like, is like well, i haven't done that yeah but, but you can go what the fuck just happened uh, <laughs> uh author we interviewed jeff strand made that mistake oh yeah he wrote a he wrote a romantic he's a horror writer he's a horror comedy writer i don't know if you know jeff strand but he decided to write Funny. a comedy um romance a rom-com under the same name. Yeah, and he's like, it didn't. My fans were like, what is. He says, most of my reviews are like, wow, I didn't think you could pull it off. So, but do you think now, you know, you're very successful at this? Do you ever go, I'm going to do a different pen name and I'm going to write blah? Yes. Um, I'm actually considering it now. Oh. Uh, because my publisher is asking me if I would consider writing in a different genre with a different name. And so what and, is the and, genre? Uh, yeah, well, I'm hoping you've had enough of your sparkling wine to answer that question. That I would just like, no, I, I'm, I'm thinking, um, and, and I did tell a friend of mine earlier today that I was doing this and I said, I think their aim is to get me drunk enough that I'll just blurt stuff out. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which obviously i'm totally compliant with um but it's an umbler. no it's it's more like a contemporary paranormal women's fiction oh so, yes so I'm, I'm assuming because you're saying all this this is going down a little far down the path than just a whimsical idea right right so that like i'm actually coming up with bullshit paragraphs about it exactly awesome. you know to to feed for people to nod and smile and go no that sounds great that sounds yeah great. that sounds like great that. 
So in New Orleans, there are these people who are witches and, <laughs> no, I don't know, but. You should write a witches. book on the Rougarou. You know about the Rougarou. I, I would love to write my own witching hour. Oh, I think that would be, be brilliant. Stop bringing up the Rougarou. Rougarou. <laughs> the Rougarou. What, is, what you oh, the Underoo? It's a Rougarou, not Underoo. <laughs> Not to be is fair. it a rougarou in underoos? Possibly. But rougarou is um, a swamp werewolf, is what I refer to it. My friend who's Creole loses her shit every time I describe it as that. But basically, it, it was like a temporary curse between two full moons that you would be cursed as a werewolf. And you could either pass it on to someone else or you had to wait it out. So it was like a really weird variant of werewolf, and it was New Orleans based. Um, so this is actual folklore, or yeah, folklore. It's actual folklore. Okay, and he had six fingers on each hand. That's how you knew someone had the curse because they had an extra digit suddenly, and which is a very old sign of witches, right? And so when you go to New Orleans and look on P the older houses stoops, you'll see that there's thirteen pennies embedded into the stoop or step someplace because if the rougarou couldn't count to 13 he couldn't come into your house it's because if the rougarou had more pennies than he had fingers because they could only could count, count with, with fingers, fingers. right if they right count to 13 then i appreciate because it. rougarous <laughs> don't have toes apparently uh, they, maybe he didn't think about using his toes because well, they're, they're not that smart no they're not so witching hour in New Orleans, I'm going to change it. You are so bizarre when you drink. Um, Why do you let me drink? Because it's entertaining. So, New Orleans, witching hour. How far down the path are we on this? Oh, not at all. I was just totally making that up. You could have so bullshitted uh, more. We were waiting for your <laughs> level of bullshit that you have proclaimed. I don't know. Who among us does not want to write about witches in New Orleans? I mean, it's like. How about witches in Alaska? We're back to Alaska again. We're back to, you know, Alaska is very rainy. I've been to Alaska and it's but lovely. It is, but you live in Santa Fe and there's quite a bit of magical energy there is land there's of enchantment energy around santa fe yes there's a whole area you could explore and not have to go very far why are you looking at me <laughs> like i, I was just making sure you I weren't going to say the I word was... rougarou or something again <laughs> so helpful on this podcast mark money <laughs> appreciates me i'm glad now we're to the people that appreciate you val <laughs> love me <laughs> <laughs> the editors are 50 50 on you apparently <laughs> so um what is the next thing you have coming out um well i mean we just had this thing come out thursday which is the collection of short stories correct novellas what? yeah okay so it's under a winter sky i mean they're longer you know, they are yes, yeah, girl. i can be corrected yes so it's um, me, Kelly Armstrong, Melissa Marr, Leslie Penelope, and Grace Draven. The editors are very excited already. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, Melissa Marr's story takes place in New Orleans. Oh. So that. But they're all stories that take place either in our world around the Christmas, Hanukkah, Pagan Solstice, or alternate world fantasy. And so the story that I wrote for this uh, collection is called The Long Night of the Crystalline Moon, Ooh. which is an alternate world fantasy. And it's about the, uh, the crystalline full moon, which is kind of like our super moon coincides with this midwinter festival called the Feast of Murano. And my characters all come together at the castle for this huge party and to observe the full moon. And it is a prequel to a new series I'm starting, starting called Heirs of Magic. Ooh. So there's this prequel story. And then the, the first book I'm calling The Golden Griffin and the Bear Prince. Ooh. 
-hmm. and that will be out in January. So that's what I'm writing right now. Like it's where that novella ends is where the first book in the and it's going to be a quartet. I swear. I think I have it figured out, and because it's a different hero hero heroine for each book, and so. So That's there's four in that series. So we're holding you accountable to that now yeah, that you've yeah, said that. You've said that. Yes. I, I really mean it this time. Really? I, I did have a series, The Sorceress Moons, that I thought was going to be three books and ended up being six. And I and people really wanted to kill me. And I'm I'm not going to do that ever again. I that was a mistake on my part. And I'm I'm sorry. Why did they want to kill you for giving them more, more of the books. characters that they love? Yeah. Because they really wanted book three to finish it i think and book three was like midpoint <laughs> the whole thing of going do not go too far with your stories do not take it to places that people are like where is she going and she's like i've got this i'm gonna run this I've way got this. we might be stuck in st louis but i swear we're gonna get to new orleans I so you have, are you working on the book now that's coming out in january yes because it's self-published Oh, so, we should talk so, just briefly about publishing. So you're self-published and traditionally published? Yes, I am hybrid. Oh. So my income is about 60, 40, trad, indie, back and forth for the last four years, depending on the year. Wow. So when what made you decide to go um, self? So I'm assuming your first, when you started going down this path, you went traditional? uh yes yes okay so well the essay collection was traditional way back when okay and then my first fiction publication so so we go through this whole thing right where i wrote this novel about the scientist and fairy and all of this and i queried it everywhere and because i had this essay collection with a university press i didn't know how well i was doing because i would query people and they would ask for the full manuscript and I didn't know how good that was at the time, because of course this was my, you know, churn out of a, a romance and make tons of money so I could finance my very important nonfiction career. And so, but I would get back all these rejections saying, oh, well, this is really well written and it's a great story and we have no fucking idea how to market it. Market it. <laughs> I know that feeling. I know it's like cross genre, cross, cross genre. I, I can tell you my crack host story if you want so uh, yeah yeah should yeah. i start should i pause now and tell you we need to up? pause could you just say crack holster so yes please it's, it's okay so because i write cross genre um i was at the rwa convention in orlando oh. and i was Almost pitching me. this book and it was not Orlando 2017. It was Orlando like 2010. It was the year it was supposed to be at Opryland and they flooded and we ended up at Dolphin Swan instead. Okay. Okay. And I pitched to this one agent and it's the one time in my entire life career that this agent made me cry. And, and I feel bad because now I have two crying stories in this podcast, but, uh, this, that, that crying is allowed. Yeah. Crying is totally allowed. There's no. just no crying in baseball. Yes. No oh, crying. that's right. No crying in baseball. We're Fortunately, I don't play baseball. <laughs> so I pitched this book to this agent and, and she looked at me and she said, the problem with your work is it falls in the cracks between genres. Ouch. Ouch. What a cool Yes. And, and I mean, I was like, I, I managed not to cry in front of her, but then I was totally in tears and I was in the bar afterwards with my friends and, you know, they're giving me drinks as, as good friends do. And I was crying and they were, and they all were calling me a crack hoe because that was. <laughs> great friends. Those are great friends. They are great. good friends. Yes. yes. That was exactly what and and it ended up being this very symmetrical thing because then it was in 2017 can, can i show off my shiny golden idol please yes. do yes of course so my shiny golden idol wow 2017 i was in new orleans again or no not new orleans sorry orlando oh. again and i won the rita in a paranormal romance 
for my Krakow books. <laughs> I like to find that agent with you and just have you hit her and then go, you know what you did. You know what? Like I've been on panels with her since and she's oh. like nice as pie to me. She's just like, oh, hi, Jeffy. And all, all this kind of thing. And I'm just like, I remember you. <laughs> she doesn't remember you though. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, you know, and I, the thing about that story is, is that's like the one agent out of, you know, hundred or you know the only person who made me feel that way but it was um a- with uh, so i'm i'm same boat i like to mix so many genres so cedric the demonic knight has won uh awards in mythology fiction even though it's sort of pitched as paranormal romance but that's how mixed of, of a bag it is and i remember querying in 2010 and i was getting full requests it was the first book i was trying to push out there and after I think 159 queries, 90 something rejections, six agents were kind enough to email me back and say, look, you've crossed too many genres. This is a nightmare to market, but I highly recommend trying this out in self-publishing because mixed genre is doing well there. So you're a crack whore as well. I am a crack whore as well. Okay. We crack hoes unite. Crack hoes unite. <laughs> I cannot wait to the next literary con. We're going to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we should make buttons i would totally wear the shirt oh yes. we should make yes shirts. i'm actually writing this down write now. it down erica yeah. genre crackers <laughs> i can spell genre don't worry okay. yeah yeah well no, you don't I, have to no. spell it you just have to be able to recognize it yeah don't i i drink all shush <laughs> okay so oh uh, we're near the end of the first part of the podcast i can't believe it we've actually gone over it's totally fine um Tell people how to find you. What is the best, not your house address. I have to say that because we had an author that was like, I live at, and I'm like, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're not doing that. So how do people find you? JeffyKennedy.com. It's the easiest way. Um, The nice thing about having a unique name is that if you put it into most search engines, you will find me. So Twitter, I am at Jeffy Kennedy. Facebook, I am Jeffy Kennedy. Very, very cool. Yeah. You have been amazing to have on this podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. So this has been drinking with authors. Val is super drunk. Yes, I am. I've been uh, America Lance. And I'm Valerie Willis. And our guest has been Jeffy Kennedy. And we'll see you next time. Sounds great.